Well, Jackie, I am so grateful uh, that you have been happy to do this and I've been so looking forward to this. Uh, you had um, uh, such an influential shaping uh, effect on my life and uh, I'm eager that, that others get to hear some of your stories and, and some of what God has done through you and some of the themes that, that God's put on your heart as well. But maybe we can start back a while, quite a while. Um, when I was growing up, Chasing the Dragon, the book that you wrote about the early part of your story, uh, was read by lots of people. I'm not sure so many people read it today. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be in Hong Kong in the first place. If I remember rightly, you were in London prior to going to Hong Kong. Is that correct? Yeah, I lived near London and I, I was at the Royal College of Music and uh, very... I always was interested in God, but I didn't like him. And uh, the Christian Union sure didn't help. And because uh, I liked the brass players, not the organists. So anyway, I, I, I just had this great uh, surety I was going to meet God one day. And uh, then I met some believers, um, old school friends on a train. And I, I was clearly looking bad after a party. So they said to one another, she really needs Jesus and mercifully not to me. So they just said, uh, oh, we have this really nice coffee every Wednesday and there are really nice men and we talk about God. So I thought I'd go. Anyway, that's how I came to know Jesus. A really wonderful man. And then what am I going to do with my life? And then every time I prayed, I mean, I thought you got answers. I, you know, I thought you asked him, what, what do you do? Or what, where do you go? And I thought he'd answer, you know. Yeah. So uh, every time he answered, uh, actually through a dream, through uh, a, a, a vision of yes. scripture, and it was always go, but not where. Yes. So uh, finally, uh, I was teaching. I'd finished college, and I'd got sev several jobs. So finally, I went to see uh, a, a vicar in um, Shoreditch. This was before it was fashionable to be in Shoreditch. And uh, I went to see him and said, um, listen, every time I've asked the Lord where to go, he says, go, but he has not been very helpful. So uh, about where? So um, we've got to stalemate. And I think I'll stay here and help you in London. And he said, no, don't. If he says go, you must go. So I said, um, well, how, how can I go? I don't know where. Um, I really thought, because I'd been to a Holy Spirit meeting. I mean, this is 1966, Holy Spirit meeting. I really thought the Lord was going to say, you know, here's a ticket and, and here's a that and here's a that. And he said, um, no, if the Lord's telling you to go, you must go. And I said, well, I, how can I? I don't know where. Um, and I tried missionary societies and things, and I was not, not well enough qualified for them. So um, he said, why don't you get on a ship? Find the cheapest one you can, calling in the most different number of countries. Get on it and pray where to get off. And What an extraordinary piece of advice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Today it's called a, a word of wisdom. Um, and or, word or irresponsibility, but I'm with you that it was a word of wisdom in, in this instance, wasn't it? Uh, that's right. So you, no, end up, you then go, you end up in Hong Kong. Yeah. Having I, bought your ticket on a boat. That's right. And at some point in those early years, you start to come across uh, poor people in Hong Kong, drug addicts and so on. And what is, maybe give us a little bit of that story, Jackie, and, and, and some of the early lessons that you started to learn about how you actually show Jesus to people very different from you, from a very different background, class, all of that. Uh, and I know there were some very particular lessons that you learned. Yeah, very much so. Um... Well, first of all, it was, it was refugee country. So this, uh, very much like much of the world today, um, Hong Kong was full of 
people who'd run or swum uh, from uh, mainland China. And uh, every other building had some cross on it. So it was Christian noodles or Christian blankets or Christian kindergartens or whatever. Everything was, everybody was on the let's help the refugee thing. But the awful thing was I, I, I couldn't meet anyone who, who knew Jesus. And I thought, oh, what's this? And I, I was introduced to a place called Wall City. And I, I can remember thinking, dear Lord, let me remember this because there's so much activity and so little life. Um, and I met this drug what addict. Was, what was the Wall City, Jackie? What was it like? Just give us a, uh, give us a picture of, of what, because I know it became very, a very important part of your life for many years. It, it was um, outside Hong Kong's law. Um, it was left out of the treaty between Britain and China. Um, so in, in the 19th century. So, uh, so officially the police weren't supposed to be there. Uh, unofficially, they were taking hundreds of thousands of dollars a day bribes and running the opium dens. There were over 32 opium dens, heroin dens, uh, little girls smuggling, little girls selling, um, everything. But it was, it was like a, like a, a rabbit warren inside on a, on a hill. So you could go from one street to another if you knew, or you could walk on the, the roofs because they built it up. So it's just like any other country's squatter huts, except these ones went up and built so close together that you couldn't see the light. And there were no toilets and there was no water. So you, you wouldn't look up anyway because people poured things into the street and the, there were just open sewers. So that was the physical conditions. Um, just, just like today in Hong Kong, I mean, physically, not a lot's changed because most people were, were living one family in one room. You know, one, one I knew where the, the, the mother had to sleep with their feet out of the door because they couldn't all fit. But that was just the physical thing. You know, when I saw kid, kids who couldn't go to school, there was no free education in those days. So the little ones looked after the babies so as the mother could go to work and she would toil at two or three jobs a day. And the fathers, half of them were on drugs because the walled city was where somehow it was the, um, the center of where you could sell drugs. And just outside the walled city, they had huge tin tents where you could, it was like a devilish feast. You could go and sit at a, a round table like a Chinese meal. And uh, you got your, your heroin and you could do what's called chasing the dragon. So we've got this epicenter of darkness and brokenness and need. And we've got a young English woman uh, sent by God, but, but not with any uh, formal training or... Uh, backing um both wonderful so <laughs> tell us more wonderful. jackie so what yeah. what what did the holy spirit teach you and how did he help you to reach people in those early days well it was uh, i think it was an angel uh, it was an old lady who asked me to visit various families and uh, you know one of them with um 11 children and mother was pregnant, uh, but they were all girls. That's why she kept having babies. And they lived on uh, just a double bunk, father out of work. Then another family where the, the, were, the mother had, was in the mental hospital and the father couldn't work, so he looked after the three children. Then another family that lived on a roof and they had five children and the father was a drug addict. I mean a roof when you climbed up the walled city, they actually lived on the roof. And their roof was a blanket, a, a cloth strung on some pegs. And uh, I was thinking, what can I give her? Um, and so all they ever ate was, was like diluted rice, no, no protein. So I thought, I, I didn't have any money myself, which was 
I now know a good thing. So uh, I thought I could buy just one Chinese sausage and slice it up. And then each one of the children could have a little protein because I, I knew if I bought a tin, the husband could sell it because the drug addict sold everything. And if I gave money, he would take it. So I, I said to her, uh, her, her, she was such a sweet, sweet lady, Mrs. Jong. I said, Mrs. Jong, I'm so very sorry. Um, I have nothing else to give you. And I, I, I prayed for her. And she said to me, that's all right, dear, because when you go, Jesus comes and talks to me. And I, I remember thinking, well, she's, she's richer than I am. And the, she did, you know, she was only just 30 and already had five children. She, she died not long after she'd be, and because she, she used to have to walk upstairs with two buckets on a pole to make her little amount of money. But I went back to the angel and I said, why are you doing this? I can see so many rich organizations, not Christians, but organizations called Christian. And they've got colored magazines. You know, this I never understood. If you've got the money to print the magazine, why don't you feed the poor with that money? I couldn't understand why you'd have a magazine about it. Uh, I still don't understand personally, but there you are. Um, why are you making me do this? I said, you're sending me to all these people and I have nothing. And she, I never forget, she looked at me and she said, I'm sending you because you care. And, and that was the first most important lesson. It, in, the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, it, it says when the man went to him, he had compassion on him. And he, he bound him up, up his wounds with oil and wine. And then it says he put him on his own donkey. I don't know if you ever read that. Not the church donkey. And, you know, if you put some on your donkey, this, this man's whole life was upset. He was on a journey and he was disturbed. And, and I, I often think he was, a, he was a businessman, you know. And he could have dropped the man off at the, at the town. You know, let's, let's put him in a shelter for, for, for people who've been waylaid. But he took him to an inn and he paid for him himself. And I don't know how the poor know, but they do. They know if something is coming from you, which is an extension of God's heart, or whether it's the church. And they're not thrilled with the church, you know. I mean, you think they would be. But it, 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 it was like, well, the Christians do this on Monday and the Buddhists do this on Wednesday and they become belligerent and, and just as if they ought to be having a handout. But when you give them yours or take them into your home, uh, somehow they know. Is um, that, a, a few minutes ago, Jackie, you said, I didn't have anything and now I know that's a good thing. Is that part of the reason for that? Or, 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 or why was that a good thing? Why was it good that you had absolutely nothing uh, in order to share with people who needed a lot? Well, when I, when I was first around in World City, or everybody thought that Christians were supposed to help you. So they, they said, you know, can you introduce me to a job? Can you send me to a hospital? Can you give me a that? Uh, can you can you baptize me? You know, not that they believed in Jesus, but they knew they could get into a good school if they were uh, 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 they had the certificate. What can they get when from from you because you're you've got an advantage? Well, can you uh, when they went to court? Could you please have a word with the judge? You know, and it was. I said actually, uh, I don't know any judges. Um, 
even if I did, I would certainly not go wink, wink. But they, they thought I would. Can you get my sister into a school? Can you introduce? And I said, uh, no, I can't. I don't know anyone of advantage. And it probably was three or four years before they believed me. When they found out I actually had nothing, I had no organization behind me. Uh, my parents would, were, my father had gone bankrupt. They weren't sending me money. I had got, you know, this was before it was fashionable for Christians to pay young Christians to, to, to go around the world for Jesus, you know, that that hadn't happened at that time. You know, so they, they when they actually found out I'd got nothing and that all the, that I'd started a youth club, all the picnics and all the, everything, I paid for myself. Then I lost all the hangers on. I, I lost all the people that thought if they came to my thing, I, they could get some kind of advantage. And I was left with all the rotten ones um, who stayed because um, they liked me. Yeah. <laughs> and they knew I liked them. So that, that was a very great advantage. You know, if you go representing the church, people are, are expecting a hand instead of the heart of God. Um, and they, Jackie, they liked you and they could sense your love for them and they liked Jesus. Tell us yes. a little bit about that and how you would introduce them uh, to the one who changed your life in, in that way. Well, the, the, the scripture says that, that Paul preached the gospel by the things he said and did by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I first went, I thought it was speaking. Um, thank God I wasn't fluent in Chinese. Otherwise, I'd have started giving them the only few ser sermons I knew. But when I couldn't, I couldn't, which was very helpful. And after a few years, um, uh, one of the, the second gang leader in the world city said, we've been watching you and lots of people come here. And he said, we can get rid of most of them by discouragement. We'll, we'll have them beaten up or something, but you're a, you're a girl, so we didn't bother. Um, and we don't care if you are offering him singing or ping pong or noodles um, or needlework. He said, we don't care what your program is. What we want to know is, are you anything to do with us? And when you'd been here um, four years, we thought maybe you meant what you said. Mm. So I found they weren't listening, but they were watching. And, and the, when they'd been hurt in a gang fight or if their mother was sick or something like that, um, they, they, they knew I would go and, and pray for them. And they knew I hadn't got anything else. Um, and yeah, so they, they were impressed. And, and what happened I, when you prayed with them? Well, you, you mentioned the signs and wonders. And I know the Holy Spirit has been, and his ministry has been a very significant part of your ministry. Yeah. But how have the two combined when you've, when you've met people, they've watched you, they think you're authentic, they are convinced you're genuine. And clearly that trust is important. But talk to us a bit about the Holy Spirit and his ministry and how he has given ways into people's hearts and all of that. I think um, the scripture says, by what you've said and done, and then by power of signs and wonders. And today people want to shortcut the doing. And they, if I could just have enough Holy Spirit you know, everybody would come to the Lord or fall down or get saved or whatever. Um, but it's, the, it's doing that shows them who Jesus is and gives you permission to do the miracle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember after I was called to, to, to bind up somebody after he'd been hit, hurt in a gang fight. And I said, oh, you, you, you have to go to the police who was full of blood. And he said, um, no, I can't because they'd arrest me, which is true. And so I bound him up, 
very badly because there's no water there. And I remember praying, Lord, they're impressed because when they've got a problem, they come to me. That's great. Um, and one of them had said, uh, she's cracked about Jesus. But apart from that, she's okay. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's, that's great. They're impressed. Um, they call me, but they're not changed. So that was when I began to pray for the power of the Holy Spirit, because I said, unless there's a change um, it, in the life of somebody whose mother's a prostitute and father's a drug addict, unless there's a change, he's going to die before he's lived. And that, so on one hand, I, I, I am, I was, I will be very happy to go on seeing no, no results. It, it's worth it in Jesus' name anyway. On the other hand, I'm very impatient, which is proper. Um, because if the Lord doesn't break through, and if, if, I, if I don't become sensitive somehow to how he wants to make that breakthrough, people will die. Uh, this is not a, you know, I'm going to start a little group and preach forever. I, 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 I really want Jesus to heal the old woman whose back is bent and the, 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 the child who's been um, bashed all his life and hit um, and, and for him to be able to be healed physically and to lift his head and know that the Lord says he's worth the, everything. And so that was why I began to pray, um, but I didn't know what I was praying for. Uh, just, dear Lord, will you give me whatever makes you real to people? It's great that they're impressed and moved, but I want to see them changed. So, so then a couple prayed for me. Uh, this, is, this is a long story, but, um, and that was when I spoke in tongues, um, which was, much less exciting than my confirmation experience, I have to say. That was before I knew the Lord. But um, <laughs> it, they, they prayed for me and I spoke in tongues and it, it, no, uh, no great anything that I had expected, uh, you know, no great feeling of love or wafting around in, on a mountain or, you know, not sitting on clouds, just embarrassment. And then, um, a year after, so I didn't, didn't use tongues because I thought, now I've got the power of the Spirit, everything's going to change, and of course it didn't. Um, I was just doing the same things as before, uh, which is basic gospel. You, 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 you have a, a dollar, you give 50 cents. They say, walk a mile, you walk two. They say, give me your coat, you give them your cloak. You know, that's just basic gospel. And not, not very dramatic. And um, so it was about a year after I, um, this couple prayed for me that another couple uh, per persuaded me, uh, I was very reluctant to, to use the gift of tongues every day in prayer. Um, and they started me off on it, which was you know, nearly as embarrassing as when I first received. Um, I've just found it a very embarrassing gift, but then it, you know, Scripture says it's foolish. So uh, I trust the Lord understands and has given me the words. So I, I have to humble myself. It's been the... embarrassing, Jackie. Has it been useful? Oh, yes, but I've never stopped being embarrassed. I mean, I've prayed. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I started to pray in tongues, then I saw things changed. People got healed. I, I talked to people about Jesus and they believed, you know, and I thought, oh, this is amazing. You know, my, my Chinese got so good. But actually I was saying the same things as I'd said before. Yeah. I was doing the same things as I'd done before. It was just somehow, uh, I don't know how it works, but I was in the right place, right time, saying the words that brought people to life. I, I don't know how it works. Terribly unfair. But, it, it, you know, that's, that's evangelism, you know. Well, that is, that is wonderful. Um, 
I'd like to just change tack slightly now, although it, it links with much of what we've said. One of the things, Jackie, that um, deeply affected me and I know many people when they've been with you has been your insistence not to ask for money, but to pray and to trust God for whatever you needed. Now, it seems to me that's a very dangerous and um, risky way of living. And um, uh, what, what, why? And uh, how has it gone for you? Okay. I, I'd have to say, first of all, it would be much riskier if you asked for money and got it. Then you might actually be not doing what the Lord is asking you. You're carrying on something because you've got the money to do it. But that we'll put that one in brackets. Uh, it, no, when, when I first went, it, it, uh, Hong Kong was a British colony, so I could work. So I, I never thought I should not. So I was teaching. So I paid my own rent. Uh, nobody shared any money with me, probably for, uh, till I'd been in Hong Kong about six years. So I didn't know that believers in Jesus expected other believers in Jesus to give to you. I just thought the Lord said, work, and I'll look after you. So um, when all these people started believing in Jesus, um, I started to have to go to court or prison, and I, it was harder to do my day job as well. And I'd already got two girls living with me um, from the Wall City in my little room. And so I said, Lord, I know you look after me. Um, but will you look after me? My, uh, we've got an echo on, on the... Just hang on a minute. Got an echo. Is it going away? Uh, yes. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, Jackie. It's absolutely. It's fine yeah. at this end. Okay, so I go back. So, um, I I trusted that the Lord would look after me, um, but I said, "What about these girls that live with me? Because they were they were just young teenagers. Do they have to pray?" And I felt that the Lord said, um, seek me and my kingdom. This is Matthew 6, 33 and 34. And I will supply what you need. And I said, and them? And he said, I will look after you and your house. Um, now, that's what he said to me. I would never tell anyone else to do that. Never. Never. I mean, I, I'm, I'm even quite embarrassed because there was one little Bible study group in London that wrote to me after this and said, we'd like to send you um, 17 pounds every three months or something like that. And I actually wrote back and said, please don't. I said, it just uh, if you want to give whenever you'd like to give, that'll be fine. I just... Uh, and, you know, I don't know if I'd do that again, but it was so, it was so, it was so clear that the Lord seek me, said, seek me in my kingdom and I will give you everything else you need. You haven't got to drop hints around the place. Um, and, and I still believe that. It's like, he's, it, it's like Jackie, he's kept you on a really tight leash on that one. There's, it's funny how he does that with this, isn't it? That. There's some things he gives us sometimes some maneuverability on and sometimes none at all. We were, we were nearly tempted when we had to put up some buildings to house our drug addicts. I mean, we lived in old, old houses that people lent us and rooms and brothels and things for years. 287 different places we prayed people of drugs or more. Um, and when we put up buildings, you know, I mean, I, 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 I tell you, I'd never do that again. But anyway, there you are. <laughs> That's uh, what most pastors say when they put up a building. It's <laughs> just, uh, well, things changed. Who, 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 and, and, and the Lord did provide. But what I did discover during that was that we had some helpers that said, you know, don't you think God might change the rules? Uh, your rules and I said well I'll, I'll ask him you know if if, if 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 we should make our needs known um, and uh, uh, I sure didn't get permission but I was 
I was tempted. It was, it was a terrible amount of money, but I discovered that as I learned when I was in my little room with two girls, how to pay for this month's rent and how to pay for the youth club. Mm. And it, it's not, um, it, it's not, a big amount is not harder than a small amount. Mm. It, it, praying for millions of dollars is the same as praying for several. It's just practice. So Jackie, if, if others are listening to this who think, mm, I, I wonder whether I've had the same prompting in one way or another, and they're thinking of starting out, whether it's in one aspect of their life or in every aspect, trusting God in this sort of way, what advice would you give them? You've lived this way for decade after decade. Any, any pointers that you would give them? I, I can't use my experience um, to, to, to shape other people's life, but I would say get your own scripture. Get your own reasons for why you believe, because that's what you're going to hang on to in, in, in the tough times. Not, not Jackie did it so I can. That, that would be terrible. And everyone's different. You know, otherwise I'm saying I'm doing it the right way and everyone else isn't. He, he, he clearly spoke to me like that. So I would say, I, I've met so many believers in Jesus and most of them are following policies. They have no idea why. And so I said, find your own scripture, find out your values. Why are you doing what you're doing? And be convinced from scripture because that's going to hold you and he's going to hold you. That's fantastic advice. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, move ground again a little bit. Um, worship has always been a really important part of the communities that you've developed. It has, I know worship is a hard thing, but it has been right at the heart of everything you've developed. Why has it played such an important role for you? What are your convictions and experience about worship that has led you to be so insistent on daily worship or, you know, people giving their hearts in that sort of way? Yeah. Um, all my early and my most favorite gatherings were, were when we were worshiping in people's houses. Um, and... Uh, I, I came to Hong Kong in, in the 60s, in, in, and at the end of the 60s, people started singing scriptures. Then they started singing um, uh, uh, love songs to Jesus, which ha hadn't been in the, in the church repertoire. And what I found was that in the atmosphere where you are, I am, praising him and then loving him, he softens my heart. And I'm able to respond to what I don't know I'm responding to. And, you know, all of our drug addicts, um, they come from a background which is uh, where they have not been asked ever, how do you feel or what do you think? They have not grown up with a vocabulary of here are my rights or this is my space or... Uh, if you ask the beaten wife, did you have a happy marriage? She's no idea what the question is. She's, what do you mean? I'm married. It, 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 they, they have come from a culture that has not discussed their feelings, but of course they have them. And, and we found that in worship, the, the hurt parts of them, the disappointed parts, the abused parts, the longing parts, the parts that wanted to dream, that the Lord would soften that and that this was just the, the perfect place for the Lord to heal people and for the Holy Spirit to work quicker than a, 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 a counseling session um, when somebody is, is trying to get you to explain what you don't know how to explain. Uh, so it, it was that the, the language of worship, which is the, the, uh, often music, though not only, um, it, is, is, it's, it's a love affair. Uh, I am loved unconditionally, and he, he keeps telling me I am, and I keep arguing with him because I, 
I still don't quite believe it. <laughs> at least, uh, you know, at least not that much. And, and so we encouraged people like yourself and other people who came, um, talk less, uh, don't give so much advice, uh, but just worship the Lord and see what he does. And it was, it, it, it was in that atmosphere. So we do that every day. Um, we break bread every day, by the way, or several times a day. Um, and it, it was in that atmosphere that, that people can be healed um, and restored and set free. And, and the Holy Spirit gifts in this, in this setting, uh, everyone can, can pray for one another and use them. It does seem to be a very important uh, part of the mix, doesn't it? That out of worship, there's not only healing, but often su other supernatural things happen as well. Yes. And, and people find freedom and the like. Yes. Um, we've, you've faced different challenges in your ministry, Jackie, over the years. Uh, most recently, there has been a global challenge with a pandemic. And it's obviously touched different nations in different ways. And I know that what's happened in the UK has been different from Hong Kong. But I'd love to hear a little bit about how your community has responded to the pandemic. And uh, I mean, it may prove that we're only in the early days of it. We don't know how long it will go on for. Or it may simply be that these sorts of things could become more commonplace in the years to come. So it seems to me very important that we learn at this point in time and take stock and take lessons so that we're more effective in our service to the world around us uh, in due course. So how has your community responded? And um, what have been the important lessons from your perspective in terms of ministering in the uh, health crisis that we've been experiencing? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story about UK, first of all. One, one of our helpers, uh, says that her brother was the, uh, the hopeless one in the family, didn't succeed academically, didn't, didn't get a good job, didn't work. And then suddenly he's called an essential worker. He stacks things at supermarket and he's become the hero in that family. And I think that really describes us, you know. We're just little people and suddenly, we're the essential workers, you know. It's, it's, it, it's not hard for us. Um, our people chose, uh, at least not the ones that were going, coming off drugs because we, we'd kept them safe somewhere else, but the other ones who'd come off drugs, whole teams of them, um, have chosen to go um, to the poor and the hungry. And uh, it's been so exciting. I mean, uh, uh, Caroline, my secretary here, is here with me and we've just got this long uh, list of stories about how people have met Jesus because you see the very poorest, well, you know this, um, they just have daily wage. So if they're laid off, they don't have a credit card. They don't even have an, an, a smartphone. They can't order in food. So we said, Lord, will you show us where they are? And we called it the five to workout, which was the five loaves, two fishes. And we asked the Lord to show us where the hidden people were, who uh, they don't qualify for government help. Um, they, don't, they, they don't have a bank account. So uh, we found people on the top of mountains living in, in huts, which they've just put up. We found uh, people in subdivided rooms who were uh, uh, starving. Um, and our men, all these essential workers carrying five kilos of rice mm. uh, up six floors to find the, the, the knocking on the door and finding someone that says, oh, you found me. And we told them, pray with people when you can. But listen, this isn't about counting how many people come to Jesus. It's a, it, we do this anyway. This is the heart of the Lord. We do this anyway. Of course, lots of people have come to know Jesus and people have got healed um, and set free. And the, the, one of the sweetest thing is in, in our particular, um, we've got lots of congregations, by the way, not, not, 
not just one community. So uh, we, we, have, we have what I call the rich, uh, as well as the poor. The mix goes very well. Um, and they've had the most fun coming. You know, because otherwise, what are they doing? They're going, start raving mad with their kids who can't go to school, you know. So we're saying, well, would you pray about being an essential worker and, uh, and actually going to the places that you are currently sheltering from and praying for the protection of the Lord? And, uh, and those who have joined in, uh, I mean, it's been amazing. They, they have never had as much fun or life in their life. They, they pray and they've had, here's a word of knowledge. The Lord has shown me, I, I may meet a lady who has this problem, an ear problem, or somebody who, whose son has this problem, and they knock on the door, and, and then they say, um, we, we, we've, anybody want masks? We, we've given out nearly 400,000 masks. Um, and we, um, is, are there any other needs here? And they give out the, the rice and the oil. And by the way, is there, is there someone here with with an ear problem, you know, so exciting. And, and, and that's really, um, the, the Lord knows. And that, if his eyes go over the whole earth, and, and yet he knows this little old man uh, who's, who's in a hut all by himself and, in, and is actually starving. He doesn't have a bank account and, and nobody's going to deliver food up to him. And someone knocks on his door and says, I, I've come. You know, he, he knows. He, he's, he's a lost person who's been found. Jackie, what you've uh, been talking about and some of the lessons you've shared are, are fantastic provocations and assistance to all of us who are pursuing that vision. And uh, one day that's going to be really wonderful to experience as well. Jackie, thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, sharing something of your story as well. Thank you.